with pain and love for contemporary man, St. Paisios of Manathos, Spiritual Councils, Volume 1, published by the Holy Monastery Evangelist John the Theologian, Surati Thessaloniki, Greece, 10th edition, 2006. Biographical Note The blessed elder Paisios, whose name in the world was Arsenios Enzinepides, was born in Farasa of Cappadocia on the 25th of July, 1924. Shortly before his family left for Greece with the exchange of populations in 1924, the elder was baptized by St. Arsenios the Cappadocian, who gave him his own name and foretold that, quote, he was leaving a monk in his place. Quote. Upon arriving in Greece, his family settled in Konitsa of Epirus, where the elder spent his childhood and young adult years. From the time he was a child, he lived an ascetic life and was nourished by the lives of the saints, whose feats he sought to imitate with great zeal and admirable precision. He practiced unceasing prayer, cultivating all along the virtues of humility and love. He learned the trade of carpentry, wanting even in this aspect of his life to imitate Christ. He fulfilled his military duty during the guerrilla war in Greece from the years of 1945 to 1949, serving for three and a half years in the army as a wireless radio operator and living ascetically even during this troubled time. During this time, he was distinguished for his valor, his ethos of self-sacrifice, moral integrity, and many other virtues. Having fulfilled his duty to his country, he entered the monastic life which he had desired from his youth. Even as a layman, he had divine experiences, but the favor of the Lord, the Theotokos, and the saints intensified during his monastic life. He led an ascetic life on Manathos, in the Holy Monastery of Stomion in Konitsa, and on Mount Sinai in Egypt. He lived in obscurity, giving himself completely to God, and God in turn revealed him and gave him to the whole world. He guided, consoled, healed, and granted peace to the multitudes of people who sought him. His sanctified soul overflowed with divine love, and his saintly face radiated the divine grace. All day long, he tirelessly gathered the human pain and imparted divine consolation. He is the founder of the Holy Monastery of St. John the Theologian in Surati of Thessaloniki, Greece, which he also guided spiritually for 28 years, from the years of 1967 to his repose in 1994. It was to this holy monastery that he also entrusted and treasured the holy relics of his godfather, St. Arsenios the Cappadocian, to whose memory a temple of Byzantine design was later erected. After suffering excruciating pains, which, as he used to say, benefited him more than the ascetical struggles of his entire life, he fell asleep in the Lord on the 12th of July, 1994, in the Holy Monastery of St. John the Theologian in Surati Thessaloniki. He was buried next to the church of St. Arsenios the Cappadocian. May we have his blessing. Amen. Preface When the blessed elder Paisios fell asleep in the Lord on 12th of July, 1994, he left behind a spiritual legacy, his teachings. Ever a simple monk with only an elementary school education, but rich in the wisdom of God, the elder emptied himself for the sake of others. His teaching was neither instructional nor catechism. He lived the gospel, and everything he taught flowed naturally from his way of life, whose main characteristic was love. He had formed himself according to the gospel, and for this reason it was his countenance that taught first, and then his evangelical love and enlightened word. When he received people of all backgrounds, he did not simply listen patiently to the problems they confided in him. But with his holy simplicity and discernment, he would enter deeply into their heart and make their pain, their anxiety, and their trouble his own. And then gradually the miracle would take place, the transformation of the person. He used to say, quote, God performs a miracle when we wholeheartedly participate in the pain of our fellow human beings. End quote. We saw with great joy the interest generated by the first books that circulated, 
on the life and teachings of the elder Paisios. Many spoke with admiration about the answers they found to their questions, the solutions to their problems, and the consolation to their grief. Our joy was even greater when people who had distanced themselves from the Mother Church became rightly concerned and changed their way of life. We often thought of the words of the hymnographer referring to St. Basil the Great. He lives though he lies asleep in the Lord. He lives even among us as one who speaks through his writings. At the same time, we felt a compelling need to offer the very beneficial words of Elder Paisios, which we were recording with reverence from the very first steps of our sisterhood, because they were so helpful to us, to our brothers and sisters in Christ who were so persistently asking for them. The good God provided that our Hezekasterion owe its very existence to Elder Paisios. It was he who received the episcopal approval of his eminence, Sensios, the Metropolitan of Cassandria, to establish our monastery and who sought to find the appropriate location. And he did this because his noble and sensitive heart felt great gratitude to us for having taken care of him when, he, when we first met him in 1966 during a hospital stay for a lung operation. From that time on, he felt that he was our big brother and had the obligation to provide for his sisters, as he used to say by establishing the Holy Monastery. The first sisters were settled at the monastery in October of 1967. Elder Paisio spent two months in the Hezekasterion to help in the organization of the Cenobitic life. After that, he would come out of Mount Athos, usually twice a year, to help the sisterhood in their monastic way of life, and he would assist each sister individually in her spiritual struggle with his God-inspired advice and his personal experience. From the Holy Mountain, the spiritual America, as he used to call it. He continued to help them through prayer and the letters he would send to each sister individually or to the entire sisterhood. In 1967, when Elder Paisio started establishing the foundations of Cenobitic life in the Hezekasterion, from the simplest practical things to the most spiritual, he was 43 years old. He had already attained the mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. And he had the wisdom of a Yeronda. From the first days of Cenobitic life, we discovered that his words were the words of eternal life, John 6.68. And that much of what he said should be taken as an axiom for our daily life. For this reason, we felt compelled to write down his words so that they would not be forgotten and could serve as a secure rule for monastic life. After we filled the first notebooks, we submitted them with considerable hesitation to his judgment. We hesitated because the elder always emphasized the practical application. He did not want us just to gather material ammunitions without putting his words into action. He always asked that we cultivate spiritually whatever we heard, or read. Otherwise, he used to explain to us there'd be no benefit from all the writings and notes, just as there's no benefit to a state when it has a lot of armaments, but lacks a trained army that will put them to use. Relenting to our persistent pleas, he agreed to see our notes and to complete or correct any points that we had not understood correctly. The recording of his spiritual counsels continued all along the 28 years that the elder was overseeing and guiding the Hezekasterion. All meetings of the elder with the entire sisterhood or the monastery council and the Yorondasa were recorded, initially by notes taken down by the sisters and later by a tape recorder. Also recorded were conversations between the elder and each sister separately, who wrote down his words immediately after her conversation with him was over. When Elder Paisios realized what we were doing, he was rather irritated. Quote, Why are you taking this down? He asked. Are you saving it for an emergency? You should put it into practice. Apply it. Who knows what you're saying in these notes? Let me see. When we showed him a sample, the notes of one sister, his expression changed. He was comforted and reassured and with satisfaction exclaimed, 
My goodness, she's like a tape recorder. She wrote it exactly as I said it. Our conversations with Elder Paisos were usually in the form of answers to our questions. In his private conversations with the sisters, the questions mainly concerned their personal struggle. In meetings with the monastery council, which were scheduled in advance, subjects were raised that concerned us during his absence. These were put in the form of questions to be discussed when he came to visit. These questions covered all kinds of subjects, administrative, practical, spiritual, social, ecclesiastical, national, and so forth. Finally, in meetings of the entire sisterhood, besides the questions raised by the sisters, the Yeranda discussed various other topics which simply came up on the spot in the course of our conversation. The elder would use every word and image he could for the spiritual benefit of the soul. The sound of an aeroplane flying over the monastery. The noise of a machine. The chirping of a bird. The opening of a door. Or a simple phrase could set him talking for a long time about a serious matter. I put everything to use, he used to say, in order to reach heaven. If we approach and work on all things spiritually, do you know how much spiritual profit can be made and what spiritual experience can be acquired? In his contacts with people, Father Paisio sought to prepare them for the kingdom of heaven by helping them to know the will of God and come closer to him. Thus he put to practice one of his favorite sayings that, quote, the good God looks after us first for our next life and then for this life. When he mentioned something about nature, science, art, or everyday life, he was not interested in these subjects in and of themselves, but used them as parables in order to awaken souls and to help them grasp the deeper meaning of life and cling to God. Because his manner of speech was simple, spontaneous, and full of natural humor, he could tell the greatest truths in a plain and joyful matter. Quote, I am making sunshine he used to say. He meant that just like the sun is necessary for the flowers to bloom, a gentle pastoral approach enables the opening and the healing of the soul. This was his enlightened pastoral care, which often prepared the, soul, the soil of the soul to receive the austerity of his words about the unyielding and steadfast evangelical truth. In this way, even his most demanding word fell upon the human heart as a beneficial dew, cultivating it and bringing forth spiritual fruit. After the Paisios fell asleep, the material that was collected during these 28 years, together with the letters that he had sent to the Hezekasterion from the Holy Mountain, was classified according to subject, so as to be used every day in the life of the Cenobium. Events relating to his life were also recorded, including those of a divine nature to which he referred not for bragging, but for spiritual charity. Quote, I'm not telling you this, he used to say, so that you can give me ribbons and bravos. When I tell a war story from the time of my military ex service or anything else, even a humorous example, I do so to make a point so that you can grasp its deeper meaning. I don't like talking about useless things, end of quote. In this manner, he made himself a spiritual blood donor. He wanted to fortify our anemic faith, trigger our philotimo. Footnote, philotimo, according to Elder Paisios, is the reverent distillation of goodness, the love shown by humble people, from which every trace of self has been filtered out. Their hearts are full of gratitude toward God and their fellow men. And out of spiritual sensitivity and a sense of honor, they try to repay the slightest good which others do for them. To return to the text. And being the noble man of God that he was, to cultivate the same nobility in us so that we can become by grace akin to God. More and more, I am emptying myself, he used to say. And what is the result? In order to help you, I am forced to speak about myself. This is such a waste, a spiritual waste. Does it at least help you? I want you to know that every time I have to mention an incident from my life, how, for instance, the providence of God has helped me 
on a certain occasion, something is being lost. I feel emptier. Does it at least bear fruit for you? Taking into account the difficult years that we're living through, we decided to publish all this material in a series of volumes, starting with those topics that would be of general interest. Although many of these topics are part of everyday life, they must still be faced according to the gospel. Otherwise, the consequences for this life, but also for our future eternal life, will be sorrowful or, worse yet, devastating. In making this decision, we were encouraged by an idea that Elder Paisios had entertained for years. He wanted to write, quote, a book that would reach everybody, laity, monastics, and clergy. The idea had never materialized since he gave all his time to the many hurting souls who came every day to his cell. He gave himself completely to them, despite his limited and diminishing physical strength. My news, he wrote in one of his letters, is many tired and suffering people. The people and their problems are ever increasing. Please pray that my physical strength not decrease. I need to provide a bit for myself because I must be ready always to help whether I can or not. As already mentioned, the elder usually responded to a variety of questions. For this reason, when faced with the task of integrating the various topics that he had addressed on different occasions, we decided to keep the dialogue form. Including, included in these dialogues are excerpts from letters he had sent to the monastery, extracts of books that he had written, as well as any additional material from his correspondence with his other brothers and sisters in Christ, who entrusted us with their letters and with their notes that they had kept in their conversations with the elder. The aim was to give each topic the fullest possible coverage. Every effort was also made to preserve as much as possible the immediacy and the grace of his spoken words. Some repetitive remarks that stressed the deeper meaning of his word and pierced many hearts were retained, as well as many exclamations, which were a natural part of his storytelling, coming from a heart that was pulsating with great love for God and all of humankind. References to monastic life are frequent, not only because Father Paisios was addressing nuns, but also because he wanted lay people to seek, quote, the joy of monasticism that springs from total surrender to God. He believed that in this way, they might be saved from the insecurity caused by a total dependence on the self. He wanted them to enjoy heaven in this life. With Pain and Love for Contemporary Man is the first volume of the series, Spiritual Counsels of the Elder Paisios of Manathos. In order to make its content more useful to the reader, it was divided into four thematic parts. Each part is subdivided into chapters and every chapter into sections with the appropriate subheadings. Footnotes that explain terms from the spiritual and monastic life will be more than familiar to those brothers and sisters in Christ who are well acquainted with patristic texts. They have been added in order to assist readers who lack this background. As Elder Paisios made frequent use of examples from science, art, and other fields as noted above, we ran the risk of not rendering correctly some of his verbal terminology or expressions and for this reason, before publication, we invited the review of certain sections and chapters from brothers and sisters in Christ who specialize in the relevant, relevant areas. We wish to thank them for examining this material with great reverence for the elder and for making the appropriate corrections. We would, of course, be grateful for any additional suggestions. We pray that the spiritual waste offered by the elder out of an abundance of love will bear fruit in the simple and good-willing hearts of his readers, and that they will be enriched with the wisdom of God that is hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed to babes. Luke 10, 21. Amin. Signed, the Sunday of All Saints, June 14, 1998, the abbess of the Holy Hesychasterion, Mother Philothei, and the sisters in Christ with me. Yeronda say something. What should I say? Whatever your heart is telling you. My heart is telling me to take a knife, 
cut my heart into pieces and give them to the people and then die. Introductory remarks from the elders' councils. Though ours are difficult and dangerous times, Christ will triumph in the end. Most people nowadays have been educated in a secular way. So they live their lives rushing around at secular speed. Lacking the fear of God, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, they also lack breaks. And as they speed everywhere without restraint, they end up going over the cliff. People are troubled by all kinds of questions, and most of them walk around in a daze, having lost their direction. Day by day, they are losing control of themselves. If those who visit the holy mountain are so confused and full of anxiety, imagine how troubled those must be who live far removed from God and the church. What we see in all nations is a gathering of storms and confusion. May God save our suffering world that is boiling like a pressure cooker. Look at those in power, the schemes they come up with. They stir and boil in their pots, and the cooker is now whistling, the steam valve ready to burst. I once asked a very important man, quote, Why do you neglect the things that matter most? What is going to become of us? Father, he said, the evil that started with a few flakes of snow has now turned into an avalanche. Only a miracle can save us. Even the few who try to help are actually making it worse. And so evil grows bigger and bigger. At first, you only see a few flakes, but then the snow picks up, gets thicker and thicker. Chunks of it start rolling downhill, turn into snowballs. On its way down, it gathers even more snow, mixed with pieces of wood and stone. And as it keeps growing, it becomes huge and uncontrollable. That's what has happened with evil. Little by little, it has turned into an avalanche, it is now coming down on us in full force. What we need is to throw a bomb and stop it. Are you agonizing over this, Yeranda? Footnote, an elder or Yeranda is a monk distinguished for his holiness, long experience in spiritual life, and a special gift for the guiding of souls of others. His response, just look at my beard. Why do you think it has turned gray so soon? It hurts me when I see evil things coming. I start shouting to prevent them from happening, but no one pays attention. And it's not out of contempt for me until something horrible happens and then they come asking for my help. Now I understand what the prophets must have gone through. They were the greatest of martyrs, even though only a few of them died a martyr's death. The martyrs suffered much, but only for a short time. The prophets, however, saw the state of things around them and were suffering all the time. Time and again they gave warning, but people went about their usual ways. When finally the time came and the wrath of God came upon them, the prophets also suffered with them. You see, back then people were so narrow-minded. They left God and worshipped idols. Today, even though we know and understand much more, the idolatry is even greater. We have not yet realized that the devil has set out to destroy God's creatures. He has drawn together an alliance to unravel the world. And he is getting rabid, seeing how people are taking notice and are concerned for the right reasons. He is even more vicious now because he knows that his schemes are short-lived. See the book of Re Revelation 12.12. 12. He resembles a criminal. When surrounded, he thinks to himself, there's no way out. They're coming to get me. And he starts destroying everything around him. Or he resembles soldiers in the battle, having run out of ammunition, draw their bayonets and swords, and lash out with a second thought. They figure, we're going to die anyway. Let's kill as many as we can. Can't you see that the world is on fire? Burning. Temptation is everywhere. The devil has set such a fire that even all the firefighters in the world could not put it out. It is a spiritual fire. Nothing but prayer is left for us now. Prayer that God may take pity on us. You see, 
when a fire spreads and the firefighters can do nothing about it. What do the people do? They turn to God and they pray for heavenly rain. The same happens with the spiritual fire started by the devil. Only prayer is needed so that God may help us. Whatever you may turn, wherever you may turn, one thing is clear. Things are falling apart. It's not, for example, that we have a house and a window or something else that needs fixing and we can take care of it. It is the entire house that is in shambles. And worse yet, the entire village. We are spinning out of control. Only God can step in and make a difference. He's got to roll up his sleeves, take a screwdriver, and with a slap here and a caress there, fix the mess. The world is harboring a blistering wound full of pus that needs to be opened and treated, but it's too soon to open it now. Evil must come to term as it did in Jericho a long time ago. People suffer so much. The things that people suffer from are endless. Young and old, entire families are breaking apart. Every day my heart is grieved profoundly. So many homes are full of distress, anguish, and anxiety. Only families that follow God's will are doing well. The rest come along with problems like divorce, bankruptcy, and illness. Others walk around dependent on medications or addicted to drugs. Their pain is more or less the same. Especially nowadays, people are out of work, in debt, and all kinds of trouble. The banks go after them and repossess their homes. They suffer every imaginable evil, and our problems are far from over. Children in these families start healthy and end up sick. Most of these people would celebrate the best Pascha if they had the chance to live carefree like monks for even one day. The world is so full of misery. When one gets to feel so much empathy that his heart aches and he cares more for others than he does for himself, he can see the entire world as if through an x-ray that beams with spiritual light. So many times when I recite the Jesus prayer, I see poor little ones, sad children passing in front of me and pleading with God. It is their mothers who make them Pray so that God will protect them from family problems and difficulties. We switch into the same frequency and make contact. We communicate. Securities and insecurity. Nowadays, people have all kinds of insurances, but being estranged from Christ, they feel the greatest insecurity of all. No other age has seen as much insecurity as our own. No human insurance can help people. Seeing that the world's ship is sinking, people rush to board the ship of the church to find spiritual safety there. But if they see that the church is also taking on water and that she has been caught up in the secular spirit and not the Holy Spirit, they too will go away disappointed, having nothing to hold on to. So many people are suffering and feel lost being forced to live in this hellish world. Others feel abandoned and indifferent to all things, especially now. They have nowhere to go in order to find help, so they grab onto anything that they can find, like a drowning man grabbing onto a straw. In desperation, a drowning man will clutch at anything to be saved. You see, a boat is sinking. And those on board are reaching to hold on to the mast, not thinking that the mast will sink too. So they grab it and go down even faster. All I'm trying to say is that people are looking for a place to rest, for something solid to hold on to. And as long as they don't have enough faith to hold on to, as long as they cannot trust in God and abandon themselves completely to him, they will go on suffering. The most important thing is to put one's total trust in God. Though ours are difficult and dangerous times, Jesus Christ will triumph in the end. You will see that many will come to appreciate the church. 
but we must be and remain upright. People will then understand that without the church, there's no way out. Even the politicians have come to realize that in the state of madness we have around us, only the people of the church can make a difference. Do not be surprised that even those who govern us have thrown up their hands in helplessness. Some folks came to see me in my cell and said, there's no other way. The monks must come into the world like missionaries. These are hard times. If only you could see clearly our condition, which we are, and what is yet to come. So many are searching. It was winter when 80 people, from students to stage directors, turned out of my cell. They were weeping and asking if they could study theology. Outrageous things are happening in the world. Everybody is looking for something, but most do not know what they're looking for. Some are seeking the truth in entertainment. Others are looking for Christ in outrageous music. Yet under so many people are searching these days, they come and stand in line to see you waiting for hours. It's one of the signs of our times that people are seeking help from a poor man like me. I am not any good, and I wonder what they will find in me and why they come to see me. I am only a pumpkin that looks like a watermelon. Today people eat pumpkin and think it's watermelon because the skin looks the same. They travel from afar without even being sure whether they will find me or not. With myself, I am disgusted. For them, I feel so much pain. Look what has happened to our world and what is becoming of us. The prophet Isaiah says that a time will come when people will find a man who is wearing a piece of clothing, and they will say to him, Come, let us make you our king. May God have mercy on us. When I read the 29th Psalm, quote, for those in danger at sea, I say to myself, my God, even the land and the whole world has become a more dangerous sea that threatens people with spiritual drowning. And when discouraged people come to see me, I read the 94th and the 37th Psalms for them. O Lord, thou God of vengeance, thou God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, O judge of the earth, render to the proud their deserts. They crush thy people, O Lord, and afflict thy heritage. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. They offer so much consolation. If people would only turn to heaven, things would be so different. But you see, today people are not thinking of God. That's why communication has become so difficult and it's hard to find common ground for understanding. I constantly pray to God to make known to us real people, real Christians, and to give them a long life in order to help the people of this world. We should all pray that God bring forth new, young, and pure people, like the Maccabees, because the present leaders are now destroying the world. Younger people may lack experience, but they do not have guile and dishonesty. Let us pray that God will enlighten all human beings, not only those in the church, but also those in power to have the fear of God and the courage to speak out. One or two enlightened words will say, and just like that, things will turn, uh, take a turn for the better, but say something foolish and it can harm an entire nation. A right decision is a blessing for the world, while a wrong decision is one for disaster. It's not only material misery that plagues people with hunger and unhappiness. It is also spiritual misery, and that is far more devastating. The Jesus prayer will help them to receive a little of Christ's light. It's that easy. Christ will take a screwdriver and with a turn here and a turn there, all will be fixed. Gradually, as God sheds his light, evil will lose face. For evil by nature is destroyed by itself. It's not God that destroys it. In the end, everything will fall into place. When I see understanding, when I see compassion, 
and a fighting spirit in many who have an important position in society, I am so filled with joy. Our age is lacking in examples. Yet under why does St. Carol of Jerusalem say that the martyrs of the last days will surpass all martyrs? See St. Cyril of Jerusalem's Catechetical Le Lectures on Illumination 15.17 to continue. Because in the old times we had men of great stature. Our present age is lacking in examples, and I am speaking generally about the church and monasticism. Today there are more words and books and fewer living examples. We admire the holiest athletes of our church, but without understanding how much they actually struggled, because we ourselves have not struggled. Had we done so, we would appreciate their pain. We would love them even more and strive with Philotimo to imitate them. The good God will, of course, take into account the age and the conditions in which we live, and he will ask of each one of us accordingly. If we only strive even a little bit, we will merit the crown more than our ancestors. In the old days, when there was a fighting spirit and everyone was trying to measure up to the best, evil and negligence would not be tolerated. Good was in great supply back then, and with this competitive spirit, it was difficult for careless people to make it to the finish line. The others would run them over. I remember once in Thessaloniki, we were waiting for the traffic light across the street, when I suddenly felt pushed by the crowd behind me as if by a wave. I only had to lift my foot, and the rest was done for me. All I'm trying to say is that when everybody's going toward the same direction, those who don't wish to follow will have difficulty resisting because the others will push them along. Today, if someone wishes to live honestly and spiritually, he will have a hard time fitting in this world. And if he is not careful, he'll be swept by the secular stream downhill. In the old days, there was plenty of good around, plenty of virtue, many good examples. And evil was drowned by the good. So the little disorder that existed in the world or in the monasteries was neither visible nor harmful. What's going on now? Bad examples abound. And the little good that exists is scorned. Thus, the opposite occurs. The little good that exists is drowned by an excess of evil, and evil reigns. It helps so much when a person or a group of people has a fighting spirit. When even one person grows spiritually, he does not only benefit himself, but helps those who see him. Likewise, one who is laid back and lazy has the same effect on the others. When one gives in, others follow until, in the end, there's nothing left. This is why it's so important to have a fighting spirit in these lax times. We must pay great attention to this matter because people today have reached the point where they make lax laws and impose them on those who want to live strict and disciplined lives. For this reason, it is important <clears throat> for those who are struggling spiritually not only to resist being influenced by the secular spirit, but also to resist comparing themselves to the world and concluding that they are saints. For when this happens, they end up being worse than those who live in the world. If we take one virtue at a time, find the saint who exemplified it, and study his or her life, we will soon realize that we have achieved nothing and will carry on with blessed humility. Just as in racing, the runner speeding for the end line does not look back toward those lagging behind, but fixes his eyes forward. So too, in this struggle, we don't want to be looking back and thus be left behind. When I try to imitate those who are ahead of me, my conscience is refined. When, however, I look back, I justify myself and think that my faults are not important compared to theirs. The thought that others are inferior to me consoles me. Thus, I end up drowning my conscience, or, to put it better, having a plastered, unfeeling heart. The road downhill is sweet and easy. 
Yeah, I don't know. Why is it so easy to do wrong, so difficult to do right? Answer. The reason is that when it comes to the good, we must strive to help ourselves, whereas with evil, it is the devil that comes to our assistance. Human beings will not imitate the good nor harbor good thoughts. Oft times, I bring the following example to lay men and women. Say, I have a car, and I say to myself, I don't really need it, and I could get a ride from a friend or even take a taxi. Why don't I give it to that poor father with all those children so that he can take them out, perhaps to a holy monastery where they can have some fun and benefit? If I give them my car, no one will imitate me. But if I have a car of the same make and model as yours and I trade it for a newer and better model, you'll stay up all night until you figure out how to afford a better one than mine. Even if the one you already have is fine, immediately you will think, I will sell the old one, get a loan for the newer vehicle. Whereas in the first situation, no one will opt to give their car to someone else who is in greater need. In fact, they will make a fool of me. People are easily influenced to do wrong. Although deep inside they recognize and accept what is good, it is easier to be influenced by evil, since in this case it is the devil himself who serves as the canonarch. Footnote, canonarch is a monk assigned to indicate what the chanters will chant next by reciting the verses. Here, the word refers to the devil who often dictates to people what to do. The sweet road downhill is easy, to find because the model of temptation is to push God's creatures sweetly down the hill. Christ has nobility. He tells us, this is the right way. If any man would come after me, he does not say, like it or not, you must come with me. The devil, by contrast, is cheap and deceitful. He will try anything to trap human beings in his own devices. God respects human freedom because he did not create slaves, but sons and daughters. Even though God foreknew the fall of human nature, he did not create us to be robots or slaves. He preferred to come and be incarnated and crucified in order to gain man's favor and consent. This freedom that God has given us is an opportunity for going through a sifting process, for coming clean, even though the devil can still do a lot of damage. The content of each heart will come to the open. Philotimo will show through. God will not abandon us. People are in such a state today that they do whatever comes to their mind. Some are dependent on medication. Others take drugs. Every so often, a few will get together and start a new religion. Considering how things are, one would expect more crime, more accidents, but God comes to our assistance. Someone visited my cell and asked me if I had a guitar. He was on hashish and talking endlessly. He did not even bother to ask if I felt like listening. And on top of that, he wanted a guitar. Others are sick and tired of their lives and they want to commit suicide or because something bad cause something bad in order to make trouble. It's not that this is just as blasphemous, just a blasphemous thought that crosses their mind and then leaves because they send it away. They are simply tired of their lives and they don't know what to do. One of them said to me, I want the newspapers to write me up as a hero. Others use people like him to do their own business. It's amazing how, with all that is going on, we are not in a worse shape. The good thing is that God does not abandon us. Our good God is guarding our world with both arms. In the past, he used only one arm. Today, with all the dangers that we face, God keeps watching over us like a mother watching over her child when it starts walking. Nowadays, Christ... The Panagia and the saints are helping us more and more, but we don't realize it. I can't even imagine where this world would be were it not for their help. So many people are dependent on medication, and their life 
is such a mess. One is an alcoholic. The other is disappointed or confused or in pain and cannot sleep. And you see them all driving cars, motorcycles, having dangerous jobs, handling dangerous equipment. Should they be driving in this condition? So many more could get hurt were it not for God keeping us from harm. It is amazing how God is keeping us safe and yet we don't realize it. I remembered in the old days our parents would go to work in the fields and they would leave us with the neighbor who would watch over us together with her children. But back then, children were balanced. The neighbor would only take a peek at us occasionally and we would go on playing quietly. In the same way, in the old days, Christ, the Panagi, and the saints would just take a peek at the world and watch over it. Today, they unceasingly prevent people from falling left and right because so many are out of balance and wavering. God helps us. It is like a mother having children with problems. One does not see well. The other is slow. The other difficult. And on top of that, she's caring for the neighbor's children, watching that they don't climb up somewhere and fall or get a knife and cut themselves or harm each other. And she must be constantly on watch, vigilant and attentive, while they have no sense of her agony. The same happens with our world. People do not understand how much God is keeping us safe from harm. With all the dangerous means available to us, we would have been destroyed were it not for his help. But, you see, we have God for our father, the Panagia for our mother, and the saints and angels for our brothers and sisters, and they protect us. If you only knew how the devil hates humankind and wants to annihilate it, how easily we forget who our enemy is. So many times the devil has wrapped his tail around the world and tried to destroy it. But God does not let him. He destroys his plans. God turns around all the evil that the devil is sending in our way and makes good out of it. The devil may be plowing the field now, but it is Christ who will sow it in the end. And we see always that when the great tribulations come, the good God does not allow for more than three generations to go by, for that's what it takes for the yeast to be ready. Before the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites threw their last fire and sacrifice into a dry well so that they could find it later and start sacrificing again. When after 70 years they returned, they indeed found that same fire and started sacrificing again. In all trying times, a remnant survives that is not swept over. God will save the yeast for the next generation. The communists worked for 75 years and stayed in power for that long. Once again, three generations passed. The Zionists have also worked for a long time, but they will not stay in power even for seven years. Difficult times lie ahead. With God's permission, a strong jolt will come our way. Difficult times lie ahead. We will be greatly tested. We have to take this warning seriously and live spiritually. It is circumstances that are forcing us and will force us in the future to labor spiritually. But we should try to do so by choice and joyfully, rather than by necessity when various sorrows come upon us. Many saints would plead to live in our times so that they would have the chance to struggle for Christ. I am happy when some threaten to get rid of me, for I say things that spoil their plans. Sometimes, late at night, I hear from inside myself the sound of people jumping over my fence, and my heart pounds sweetly. But then I hear them shout, A telegram has come in requesting that you pray for one taken ill. I say to myself, Was that all? There goes my chance. Not that I'm tired of living, but the thought gives me joy. We should be happy that we are now given this opportunity to struggle. That itself is a great wage to have. In the past, when a war broke out, 
One was vigilant and took up arms to fight the enemy and defend his homeland, his nation, and his family. Today it's not our homeland that we are called to protect and fight for in order to prevent the barbarians from burning our houses and dishonoring our sisters. Nor are we called to struggle for a nation or for an ideology. Today, it is either for Jesus Christ that we are called to arms or for the devil. It is a clear front. During the Nazi occupation, one would become a hero by not saluting a German soldier. Nowadays, heroes are those who do not salute the devil. Have no doubt about it. We will become witnesses to horrific events. There will be spiritual battles. The saints will become holier, and those who live in faith, in filth, will get filthier. Revelations 22, verse 11. Yet I feel a great consolation inside. This storm shall pass too. Our struggle counts because it is not a struggle against Ali Pasha or against Hitler or Mussolini, but against the devil himself. For this reason, our wages will be heavenly. May God, being the good God that he is, take all that is evil and turn it into good. Amen. Part 1. Sin and the Devil. We taste bitter poison when we live apart from sweet Jesus. Chapter 1. It is fashionable to sin. Yarondo, did you tell anyone that there's going to be a war? That's what we heard. Is it true? I have not said anything of the sort, but people come up with things. Even if I knew something, to whom would I say it? Yet under war is such a barbarous thing. If people did not have the courtesy of sin, they would not have reached this barbarous state. Even more barbarous is this moral degradation. People's bodies and souls are falling apart. Someone told me they call Athens a jungle, but no one is leaving the city. Everyone calls it a jungle, and yet everyone still gathers there. Human beings have come down to the level of animals. You know what animals do when they enter the stable? They defecate and urinate. Then, as the manure ferments, they feel warm and don't feel like getting themselves out of there. The same happens with human beings. They feel the comfort of sin and don't have the heart to leave. They smell the stench, but they stay anyway. You see, if someone were to come inside the stable, he would not be able to stand the stench. But those who have got used to it are not bothered. You know, the, some people say that it's not only today that people are sinning. This has been going on ever since ancient Rome. Yes, but the Romans were idolaters. And when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, he was writing to baptized idolaters who had gone back to their bad habits. We should not take an, an example a decadent era. Today, they have taken sin and made it fashionable. Have a look at us, an Orthodox nation, and yet we're in such a state. Imagine how other nations must be. And the worst thing is that today, that the sin has become so fashionable. If people see someone who does not go with the flow, avoids sin, and is pious, they consider him old-fashioned and backward. For them not to sin is considered an insult, and to sin is considered progress. And this is the worst thing of all that could happen. If today all those who live in sin would only acknowledge their condition, God would have mercy on them. Instead, they justify the unjustifiable, and they glorify sin. This is the greatest blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. They take sin to be progress and morality the status quo. For this reason, the wages of those who struggle in the world and maintain a pure life are great and of great worth. In the old days, if one were a pervert or a drunk, they would be ashamed to appear in public because people would scorn them. A woman who had strayed even a little did not dare to come out of her house, and in a way, this was a sort of restraint. These days, if someone is upright, say a young woman who lives a life of piety, people will say, look at how she lives. 
Back then, when lay people sinned, poor souls, they felt their sinfulness, bowed their head a bit, and would not mock one who lived a spiritual life. On the contrary, they actually admired them. Today, people have no sense of their guilt, and there is no respect. All standards have been leveled, and people make fun of those that don't live a worldly life. The Checks of Conscience Although France is an advanced nation, it's not underdeveloped. Recently, 80,000 people converted to Islam. This was uh, footnote said in November 1988. Why? Because they've turned sin into a fashion. You see, there are, they are bothered by their conscience. They know that something is wrong and they want to set their conscience at ease. And just like the ancient Greeks, made up the 12 gods in order to justify their passions, these people seek a religion that would put their souls to rest. Islam is, in a way, the best suitable solution. It allows them to take as many women as they want for wives. It promises in the next life, quote, mountains of rice, lakes of yogurt, and rivers of honey. And no matter what their sins are, once their dead body is washed with hot water, they're cleansed. They go to Allah clean. What else could they ask for? It's also convenient. But these French converts will not find rest. Although they're trying, they will not find rest because the passions can never be justified. No matter what people do, even if they are insensitive, heartless, and soulless, they will not find peace and rest. They try to justify the unjustifiable, but inside they're tormented and agitated, and that is why they are constantly craving entertainment, listening to loud music, getting drunk, and watching television. They want distraction in order to forget, because their conscience bothers them. They can't even rest when they sleep. You see, there is the conscience. The first holy scripture that God gave to Adam and Eve was conscience. And we inherit it from our parents like a photocopy. No no matter how hard we may try to run over our conscience, it is still there checking on us. That is why people say, this thing is eating him up. Indeed, there is nothing sweeter than having a clear conscience. One feels like he has wings. He soars. Separation from God is hell. I cannot remember even a day without divine consolation. Sometimes, of course, interruptions occur and I feel bad. Then I can understand how horrible are the lives of most people who live without this consolation because they've distanced themselves from God. The more one distances himself from God, the worse things become. One may have nothing else, but having God is all that he needs. That's it. Even if one has everything but lacks God, In his heart, he will be tortured. That's why it is important to get as close to God as possible. It is only next to him that we can find true and eternal joy. We taste bitter poison when we live apart from sweet Jesus. When a sinful man becomes a man of God again, a prince, he's fed with divine pleasure, with heavenly sweetness, and feels the delight of paradise. Though he lives on earth, he gets to taste the joy of heaven. Every day that goes by, his joy grows bigger, and he gets to wonder if there's in heaven something higher than what he experiences here on earth. Such is his situation that he cannot do any work. His knees bend over like candlesticks from that divine warmth and sweetness while his heart leaps and tries to shatter its thin cage to run away because earth and all earthly things appear then to be worthless. In the beginning, man had communion with God. Later, however, when he moved away from the grace of God, he was like someone who used to live in a palace and then was banned from it and now views it from a distance and weeps. Just as a child suffers away from its mother, man also suffers when he is distanced from God. We are tormented. Separation from God is hell. The devil has managed to distance people from God so much that they have reached the point of worshipping statues and sacrificing even their children to them. It's a horrible thing. 
Where do the demons find all these deities? The god Kemosh? Just hearing his name is enough. But the devil is the most tortured being of all because he is the farthest removed from God, from love. When love departs, hell sets in. What is the opposite of love? Evil and malice. Evil equals suffering. One who has distanced himself from God becomes prone to demonic influence, while the other one who is close to God receives divine grace. He who already has God's grace will be given more, and he who has only a little and scorns it, he will lose it all. The grace of God is missing from most people today, because by sinning they throw away whatever small portion of it they may have. And when divine grace is gone, the demons rush at human beings and take possession of them. Depending on their distance from God, people are in constant pain in this life and will be in eternal pain in the other life. For the taste and joy of paradise begin, to an extent, in this life, depending on how much one lives according to the will of God. Either we shall experience a portion of the heavenly joy here on earth and will then go to heaven, or we shall experience a portion of Hades here, and God forbid we shall end up in hell. Paradise is goodness. Hell is malice and evil doing. When we do something good, we feel joy. When we do something wrong, something evil, we suffer. The more good one does, the more joy he feels. The more one causes harm, the more his soul suffers. Can a thief feel any joy? He cannot, but the one who does good, he feels joy. Even if one finds something on the street and keeps it for himself, he will not find rest. Although he doesn't know who to whom it belongs, nor has he harmed anyone, nor stolen it. I mean, he cannot find peace. Imagine if he'd actually stolen it. Even when we receive something, a gift, we still do not feel the same joy that we do when we give. How then could someone who steals or takes away unjustly feel joy? That is why one can look at people who live unjust lives and see on their faces so many grimaces. The boss you work for will pay your wages. People who live away from God are always without consolation and are doubly tormented. If one does not believe in God and in the future life, he is not only deprived of divine consolation, but also brings eternal condemnation upon his soul. The boss you work for will pay your wages. If you work for the devil, he will pay you by making your life miserable here on earth. If you work for virtue, Christ will pay you. And the more you work for Christ, the more you will shine and find bliss. But we say, am I a fool to work for Christ? Isn't this horrible that we do not recognize Christ's sacrifice for humanity? Christ was crucified to save us from sin, to cleanse mankind. Look at what Christ has done for us. What have we done for him? People want to sin, but they also want God to be good to them. He should keep forgiving us while we continue to sin. We want to do whatever we like and we want him to forgive us. He is supposed to forgive us no matter what we do. People don't have faith in God and they rush to commit sin. All that is evil begins from lack of faith. People don't believe in eternal life and for this reason nothing stops them. They treat others unjustly. They abandon their children, the things that take place so many grave sins. Not even the Holy Fathers had foreseen such sins in the sacred canons. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah when God had said, quote, I don't believe that such sins exist. I should go and see for myself. Genesis 18 verse 21. If people don't repent and return to God, they will lose eternal life. Men must be helped in order to feel the deeper meaning of life, to come to his senses and to experience divine consolation. The goal is to rise spiritually, not simply to avoid sin. Chapter 2 These days the devil is roaming free. When we sin, we give rights to temptation. There's so much demonic influence in the world today. 
the devil is roaming free because people have given him the right to do so and they are, they are vulnerable to horrific attacks by him. Once someone rightly said, in the old days the devil was preoccupied with human beings. Not anymore. He shows people the way, tells them farewell, and off they go. It's terrible. You see, when the demons wanted to enter the swine in the country of the Gadar Gadarenes, they asked for Christ's permission, since the swine had not given the devil an excuse. He did not have the right to possess them. Christ allowed this to happen so that the Israelites, who were forbidden from eating pork, may be punished. Yet on the, some people say that the devil does not exist. I know. Some, someone told me that I should take out of the French translation of St. Arsenios the Cappadocian all references to demonic possession, because Europeans will not understand it. They don't believe in the existence of the devil. You see, they explain everything with psychology. But if they took to psychiatrists the possessed of the gospel, there would be no end to the electroshocks. Christ has removed from the devil the right to do harm. The devil can harm us only if we allow him to have power over us. Those who do not participate in the mysteries of the church give rights to temptation and become vulnerable to demonic influence. Yeranda, in what other ways can one give rights to the devil? Rationalism, contradiction, stubbornness, willfulness, disobedience, and insolence are all qualities of the devil. People are vulnerable to the degree that they have these qualities. But when the soul is purified, the Holy Spirit enters a man and fills him with grace. On the contrary, when it is infected with mortal sin, the unclean spirit dwells in him. When again the soul is not mortally infected, then it is merely under the influence of the evil spirit. It is unfortunate that nowadays people don't want to curb their passions and their will. They do not accept anyone's advice. From this point on, they speak with insolence and re reject the grace of God. As a result, anything they undertake does not prosper because it is subject to satanic influences. Man is beside himself because the devil directs him from the outside. The devil is not inside the man, God forbid, but even from the outside he can take over and run a person's life. When divine grace departs from a man, he becomes worse than the devil, for there are things that the cunning devil himself will not do. Instead, he will urge men to do them for him. He does not, for instance, commit crimes. He has man do them for him. That is how people end up being possessed. Confession deprives the devil of his rights. If people only went to a spiritual father to confess their sins, the demonic influence would cease and they would be able to think more clearly. Nowadays, they cannot even think because of demonic influence. Repentance and confession deprive the devil of his rights over us. Recently, footnote, this was said in June of 1985. At that time, Father Paisios was residing in the Panagura cell on Marathos. Recently, a sorcerer came to the holy mountain and blocked the road with sticks and nets near my cell. Anyone passing through there who had not been to confession would have been harmed and would have no idea why. As soon as I saw them, I crossed myself, went through, and broke the spell. Later on, the sorcerer came to my cell and told me about his evil schemes. Then he burned his books. The devil has neither power nor dominion over those who have faith, who go to church regularly and receive Holy Communion. He, he just barks a little, erp, erp, like a dog without teeth. But he has great power over one who has no faith, and gives him the excuse to take over. He can lynch him and tear him to pieces with his teeth. The devil's authority over, upon a soul depends on the rights that this soul has granted him. Even when a soul dies in good order, as it rises to heaven, the devil follows behind. 
It's like a train moving with tremendous speeds while dogs are running after it and in front of it barking and occasionally some of them getting run over. But if one is not in good spiritual order, the train cannot go with speed because its wheels are damaged. Dogs will enter through its open doors and bite some passengers. When the devil has been allowed to acquire great rights over a man and has him in his grip, the cause that will bring his power to an end must be found. Otherwise, no matter how intensely the others pray for someone, the devil will not leave him. The devil will cripple a man. Priests may do exorcisms over and over again, but the possessed man ends up paying the price since the devil will then torture him even more because of the exorcisms. Unless we repent and go to holy confession and destroy the rights that the devil has over us, he will not go away and we will always be troubled. As long as the devil has these rights, he will not go away even if one reads and rereads exorcisms for days, weeks, months, or years. The devil will not approach a pure creature of God. Yet under why am I overwhelmed by passions? If one gives in to temptations, he is seized by the passions. What God wants from you, which is for your benefit too, is to take your passions and throw them at the devil's face. Turn your anger, your stubbornness, and so on against him. Or what is even better, sell your passions to the devil and use the money to buy stones to throw at him and keep him at a distance. Most often we human beings allow the enemy to harm us by giving him all kinds of excuses, either through carelessness or through proud thoughts. The devil can even take advantage of the simplest thought or word. I remember once there was a family who had great love for each other. One day, the husband he started saying to his wife, I will divorce you. And the wife was telling him the same thing back. I will divorce you. They were only kidding, of course. But the tempter, the devil, took advantage of it and set up some minor difficulty, which brought them on the verge of a real split. They did not even think of their children or of anything else. Unfortunately, a spiritual father talked to them, and he said, Are you going to divorce for something so trivial? He asked them. After that, they came to their senses. If one strays from the commandments of God, his passions will turn against him. And if one lets the passions wage war against him, the devil does not even need to bother with him again. The demons, too, are very skillful. They strike fast, looking for some passion, some weakness to start fighting against him. We must be careful to keep the doors and windows, our senses, shut, and leave no crack open for temptation that will let the enemy in. These are the weak points. If you leave even a tiny crack open, the devil can get in and cause damage. The devil enters a man when there is mud in his heart. He does not approach a pure creature of God. When the heart is cleansed, then the enemy goes away and Christ returns. Just like a pig, which grunts unhappily and goes away when it does not find mud, the devil will not come close to a heart that is not mired in filth. What sort of business could the devil have in a pure and humble heart? If, therefore, we realize that our house, which is our heart, is in ruins, and the enemy has moved in, we have to tear it down immediately in order to get rid of our bad tenant, the devil. For when sin has gotten hold of a man for a long time, the devil will naturally have greater authority over him. The devil acquires more and more rights. Yet on the, suppose a person who has lived carelessly by giving the devil authority over him decides to start a new life by putting things in order and living carefully. Will that person be fought by the devil? When these people turn around, God gives them strength, illumination, and divine consolation to get them started. But as soon as the struggle begins, the enemy will fight them fiercely. At that point, patience and perse perseverance is needed. Otherwise, how can the passions be uprooted? How can the old man shed his garment? How can pride go away? 
This is how we realize that we can do nothing on our own and we humbly ask for God's mercy. It is then that humility comes. The same happens with someone who wants to give up, let's say, a bad habit, for instance, smoking or drugs. At first, he feels happy with his decision and throws them away. Then he sees other people smoking and drinking or whatever, and then a fierce battle begins. If he overcomes the temptation, he turns his back to the habit without difficulty. All of us need to resist a little. The devil does his job, shouldn't we do ours? We should not start a conversation with the devil. All of us have some inherited weaknesses, but these cause us no harm. For instance, one may be born with a little mole on the face. A mole might make someone look beautiful, but if it is scratched, it may also cause cancer. We should not let the devil scratch our passions. If we let him do that, cancer may occur. We should have the spiritual courage to scorn the devil and all his cunning telegrams, our thoughts, and never start a conversation with him. Even if all the lawyers in the world were gathered together, they would not be able to compete with the tiniest of devils. If we want to end all relations with the tempter and avoid being tempted, we must cut off all conversation with him. Did something bad happen to us? Have we been treated unjustly? Have we been insulted? We should first check and see if we were wrong. If not, we have our reward. There's no need to carry on. If we carry on with the devil, he will weave his la lace around us and will cause us great confusion. We will be forced to scrutinize everything with a satanic legalism and will end up wild and agitated. I remember when the Italian army withdrew, they left behind piles and piles of hand grenades inside their tents. Powder magazines were piled up even higher. People would come to get the tents. Children would play with the hand grenades and so many of them, poor souls, were killed. Playing with hand grenades and we want to play games with the devil? The devil is weak. Yananda, my thoughts tell me that now, more than ever, the devil has great power. The devil has malice and hatred, but he does not have power. It is God's love that is all-powerful. The devil tries to appear powerful, but he can't make it. He appears strong, but in reality he is powerless. Many of his destructive schemes, they fail even before they start. Would a good father ever allow a few young hoodlums to bully his children? Yet under the demons scare me. What are you afraid of? The devil has no power. Christ is all-powerful. The tempter is rotten. Don't you wear a holy cross? The devil's weapons are weak. Christ has armed us with his cross. Only when we abandon our spiritual armor is the enemy strong. An orthodox priest had only to show a small cross to a sorcerer, and the demon he had provoked started trembling. Why is the devil so afraid of the cross? Because when Christ received the spitting, the blows and the beatings, the kingdom and the power of the devil were crushed. How wonderful is the way in which Christ defeated the devil. The devil's dominion was crushed with a reed, used to say a saint. When Christ was given the last blow with a reed, at that very moment the devil's power was destroyed. In other words, patience is our spiritual defense and humility our greatest weapon against the devil. The greatest balm that Christ's sacrifice on the cross gave us is the crushing of the devil. After the crucifixion of Christ, the devil is like a snake with no fangs, with no poison. He's like a wild dog without teeth. All poison was removed from the devil. All teeth were removed from the wild dogs that are the demons. So they're now disarmed while we are armed with the cross. There's nothing, really nothing that the demons can do to a creature of God when we ourselves don't hand over rights to them. They only make noise. They have no authority over people. Once when I was at the, the cell of the Holy Cross, I kept a wonderful vigil. 
a whole bunch of demons had gathered at night on the roof of the cell. At first, they banged the walls with a sledgehammer. Then they made all kinds of noise as if they were going to, as if they were rolling big logs and tree stumps. I started making the sign of the cross at the ceiling and chanting, Thy cross we venerate, O Lord, and we glorify thy holy resurrection. I stopped. They started again. Huh, now, I said to myself, we'll have two choirs, you from up there with the logs and me down here. When I started, they stopped. At one point I was chanting, Thy cross we venerate, O Lord, and we glorify thy holy resurrection. And the other, Lord, you have given us your cross as a weapon against the devil. I spent the most delightful night in psalmody, and when I would stop for a while, they would start the entertainment. Every time, they put on a different performance. Didn't they leave the first time you chanted? No. As soon as I stopped, they started. Both choirs had to have their vigil. It was such a beautiful night. I chanted with such longing. I had a great time. Yananda, what does the devil look like? Do you know how, quote, unquote, beautiful he is? He's something else. You have only to see him to believe it. But God's love does not allow that man can see the devil. For sure, most people would die from fear. Imagine if they could see how he operates, if they could see his sweet form, some among them, however, might really be entertained. I mean, entertained like the movies. But to get to see this kind of show, one must do a lot of work in advance, and even then he might not make it. Does he have uh, horns and a tail? Yes, he is fully equipped. Yaranda, did the demons become so ugly when they fell? And from angels they became demons? Of course. And it's like, it's like they've been struck by lightning. You know, when lightning stri strikes a tree, doesn't it turn it into a, like a charred stump? The demons look like that. For a while I used to say to the devil, come by so I can see what you look like and avoid falling into your hands. Just a look is enough to see how evil you are. Should you get me, there's no telling how much I will suffer. The devil is dumb. Yet under, does the devil know what we have in our heart? Answer, does, know the human heart? That's the last thing he is fit to do. Only God has knowledge of our heart. And it is only to those who belong to him that he occasionally reveals, and that for our own good, what is in our heart. The devil knows only the mischief and the evil that he plants in those who serve him. He does not know our good thoughts. Sometimes he figures it out from experience, but even then he usually misses the point. And if God does not permit him to do that, then he's constantly off target because he's in the dark. Visibility, zero. For instance, he has no way of knowing a good thought that crosses my mind. But if I have a bad thought, he is aware of it because he planted it there himself. If, say, I want to do something good to save someone, the devil does not know this. But when he puts a thought in the mind of someone and tells him, hey, go and save that person, he will also plant pride in his heart. And that's why he knows this thought. The moment we accept pride, we provoke temptation. These things are very subtle. Do you remember the incident with Abba Makarios? Once, Abba Makarios ran into the devil, who was coming back from a nearby desert where he had gone to tempt the monks. The devil said to him, All the brothers are very angry with me, except one who is my friend and obeys me, and when he sees me, he spins like a wheel. And who is this brother? the Abba asked. Theopemptos, Godsend, is his name, the devil answered. Abba Makarios went to the desert and he found the monk. He found a way to make him reveal his thoughts to him. And in this way, the monk was helped. 
When Abba Makarios met the devil again, he asked him about his brother monks, and he said, Everyone is very angry with me, and the worst, even my friend, has now changed. I cannot figure out how, and he is the angriest of all. Footnote, this is straight from the sayings of the Desert Fathers, Makarios the Great. To continue, the devil did not know that Abba Makarios had gone to the brother and helped him because the saint acted with humility, out of love, and the devil therefore had no power over that particular thought. If Abba Makarios had taken pride in what he did, he would have dispelled the grace of God, and the devil would then have acquired rights over him. Were that the case, the devil would have known, because it would have been him who caused the Abba's pride. Question. If we tell someone a good thought that is on our mind, can the devil hear it and tempt us afterwards? Answer. How could he hear it since the thought has no devil in it? But if he says what is on his mind in order to brag, then the tempter will get in the way. In other words, if there is a predisposition for pride and one brags, I, I will save this man. The devil will interfere and will know that thought. But if one acts with humility, out of love, the devil will know nothing. We need to be careful. These are very fine and subtle things. That is why the Holy Fathers say that the spiritual life is the science of all sciences. How come then yet under a fortune teller can tell three women that the one will get married, the other will suffer a misfortune, and the third will remain unmarried, and things actually turn out that way? Look, the devil is experienced. Just like an engineer can determine when a house will collapse by merely looking at it, so too the devil can look at how we live our lives and has the experience to tell where we are going to end up. The devil is not clever. He's actually very dumb. He's all tangled up. He cannot be unraveled. He does some smart things and some dumb things. His deceptive machinations are crude. God has mercifully seen to that so that we can recognize him. One must be too blinded by pride not to realize who he is. When we are humble, we can recognize the devil's traps because humility enlightens us and brings us into kinship with God. It is humility that disables the devil. The reason that God allows the devil to tempt us. Yet under why does God allow the devil to tempt people? So that he can select his children do whatever you want, God tells the devil, because no matter what he does, in the end the devil will be smashed on the cornerstone that is Christ. If we believe that Christ is the cornerstone, then nothing will scare us. God does not give the devil the permission to test us unless something good is to come out of it. When he sees that a greater good will come out of it, he lets the devil do his job. Do you remember what Herod did? He killed 14,000 infants, but in doing so, he made 14,000 martyr angels. Can you believe it? 14,000 martyrs and angels. The devil has his face crushed. Diocletian became the devil's partner when he brutally persecuted Christians, but against his will. He did great good to the Church of Christ because he enriched it with saints. He thought that he would eliminate all Christians, but in the end, he fell short of his expectations. He left countless holy relics for us to venerate and made the Church of Christ stronger. God could easily have wiped the devil off. He is God, after all. If he wishes, he can wrap him up and send him to hell. But he lets him be for our benefit. He would never allow him to torment and torture his creature without any reason. He let the devil loose up to a point, and for a specific time, so that the devil can help us with his malice by tempting us and sending us running to God for help. He will only allow the devil to tempt us if that is going to do us good. If nothing good will come out of it, he will not allow it. God permits everything for our own good. We should believe this. He lets the devil be so that man may keep up the fight. No pain, no gain. 
If the devil did not torment us, we would have taken ourselves for saints. Thus God allows the devil to attack us with malice, because these beatings clear out all the dust from our dusty soul. Other times, God lets him bite us hard so that we may seek refuge in him. God is constantly calling us close to him, but we usually stray away and we'll run to him only when we're in danger. When man becomes one with God, there is no place for the evil one to enter, and there is no reason for God to permit him to tempt us so that we may take refuge in him. Whatever else is the case, the devil can benefit us. He helps us become holy. This is the reason that God tolerates them. God has given freedom not only to human beings but also to the demons because they do not and cannot damage the human soul unless, of course, we ourselves want to harm our soul. On the contrary, evil or careless people who unwillingly harm us provide a gain for our soul. Why do you think the Abba says, take away temptations and no one will be saved? Temptations can do us great good. Not that the devil can ever do good, since he is all evil, but our good God blocks the stone he throws at us to break our head, puts it in our hand, and gives us a handful of almonds to crack and eat. God, in other words, allows temptations not because he wants the devil to torment us, but in order for us to take in this way our exams for the next life and have no unreasonable expectations for the second coming. We must realize that we are at war and we have to go on fighting against the devil as long as we are alive. During this lifetime, we've got a lot of work to do to improve our souls, but we also have the right to take spiritual exams. If we die without having passed the test, there will be no other chance. There will be no makeups. The devil does not want to repent. The good Lord created angels, but some of them fell because of pride and became demons. God created man, his perfect creation, to replace the fallen order of angels. This is why the devil is so very jealous of man, God's creature. The demons are always complaining. We erred only once and you're still punishing us, but they who err so many times, you always forgive them. Yes, but people repent, while they who were angels once and then became demons do not repent, and instead they become even more cunning and malicious, and have set on destroying God's creatures with a vengeance. Lucifer was the most luminous order of angels, and in the end, because of their pride, they distanced themselves from God thousands of years ago, and continued to do so, remaining unrepentant. If they would only say, Lord, have mercy on us, God would do something for them. If only they cried once, we have sinned, but they don't. If the devil were to cry out, I have sinned, he would become an angel again. God's love knows no bounds, but the devil has a strong will, obstinacy, egoism, and does not want to relent. He does not want to be saved. How horrible. And he used to be an angel. Yet, on the, does the devil remember his previous state? Of course he does. He is infuriated because he doesn't want others to become angels and replace him. And he is getting worse. As time goes by, he's becoming more malicious, and more jealous. If only we could feel the state of misery of the devil. We would be weeping for him day and night. Even when you see a decent person become a criminal, you feel so sad. Imagine what we would feel if we were to see not what has happened to a man, but to an angel. Once a monk, footnote, it was confirmed later, this monk was Elder Paisos himself. Once a monk felt such pity for the demons that he knelt down and prayed as follows. You are God, and if you want, you can find a way to save these wretched demons, who, while they had known such great glory before, they now possess all the malice and devilishness of the world. And had it not been for your protection, they would have destroyed us all. 
And while he was saying these words, praying with pain, he sees a dog's head appear next to him, sticking his tongue out and mocking him. It seems that God allowed that to happen in order to inform the monk that he is ready to accept the demons if they only repent, but they have no desire to be saved. You see, the fall of Adam was countered with God's coming to earth, the incarnation. The devil's fall can be countered only if he is humbled, but he cannot be corrected because he does not want to. Do you know how much Christ would rejoice if that were to happen? It's the same with man. He cannot be corrected if he does not want to. Yet on the, does the devil know that God is love and that he loves him and yet despite that is not willing to abandon his schemes? Of course he knows, but his pride does not allow him to repent. He is also cunning and is now trying to win over people. He's thinking to himself, if I get more and more followers at the end, God will be forced to have mercy on all his creatures and he will take me in too. This is what he is thinking, and that is why he wants to gain more and more followers. Do you see what he is up to? He is saying to himself, I have so many people on my side that God will have to show mercy on me too. He wants God's mercy, but he doesn't want to repent. Didn't Judas do the same thing? Judas knew that Christ would liberate the dead from Hades, but he said to himself, I will get there before Christ does, so that he will liberate me too. Do you see how cunning he was? Instead of asking Christ for forgiveness, he went and hanged himself. And you know that God's mercy bent the fig tree, but Judas raised his feet so that they would not touch the ground, and he died. And he did all that to avoid saying, Even one have mercy on me. What a dreadful thing. Similarly, the devil, the master of selfishness and pride, does not confess that he has sinned, but continues to work hard to increase the number of his followers. Humility destroys the devil. Humility has great power and destroys the devil. It is the strongest shock that you can give the devil. Where there is humility, there is no place for him. And where there is no devil, there are, of course, no temptations. Once an ascetic pressed the devil to recite Agis o Theos, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. The devil said, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, but he did not say, have mercy on us. The, the ascetic, he insisted, say, have mercy on us, eleisonimas, but to no avail. Had he complied, he would have become an angel again. The devil will say anything except, have mercy on me, because this requires humility. To say, have mercy on me, requires humility indeed, and the soul receives the requested great mercy from God, our good Father. No matter what we do, we need humility, love, and nobility. Things are simple. It is we that make them difficult. To the extent possible, we must do what is difficult for the devil, and easy for man. Love and humility are difficult for the devil and easy for man. Even a sickly man who cannot become an ascetic can defeat the devil with humility. In just one second, man can either become an angel or a devil. How? By choosing pride or choosing humility. Do you think it took hours for Lucifer to turn from an angel into a devil? Not at all. It only took him a few seconds. The easiest way for us to be saved is through love and humility. That is why we must start with love and humility and then go on to the rest. Pray that we might continuously give joy to Christ and distress the devil, since the devil happens to like hell so much that he does not want to repent. Chapter 3. The Secular Spirit. The Devil Rules Vanity. Yeah, why do they call the devil the ruler of the world? Is he really? Answer. God forbid. That's all we need now to have the devil rule the world. When Christ said that the devil is the ruler of this world, 
John 16, 11, he did not mean that he has power over the world, but that he has dominion over vanity and lies. God forbid if the devil were to govern the world. But those who have given their heart to vanity, to profane things, they live under the authority of the rulers of the darkness of this world. This means that the devil rules over vanity and all those who are dominated by it. By the world, cosmos in Greek, what does cosmos mean? Doesn't it mean jewelry, a vain adornment? Anyone then who is captivated by such vanities is the devil's possession. A heart that is captivated by the vanity of this world will naturally maintain both an atrophic soul and a muddled mind. In such a state, one may appear to be a human being, but in substance, he's only a spiritual freak. My thought tells me that the greatest enemy of our souls, greater than the devil himself, is the secular spirit, because at first it lures us sweetly, but in the end will leave us bitter forever. Whereas if we could see the devil himself, we would be so frightened that we would be forced to seek refuge in God and secure paradise. Nowadays, too much world, an excess of secular spirit, has entered the world and will destroy us. People have taken this world into their hearts and have expelled Christ. Yet, under, why is it so difficult to understand how bad the secular spirit is for us? And why are we lured by it? Because the secular spirit enters into our heart gradually, like the porcupine entered into the hare's nest. In the beginning, the porcupine pleaded with the hare to allow it to put just his head inside the nest for a while so that it will not get wet. Then it put one foot in, then the other, until finally it entered fully and with its thorny quills evicted the hare completely from his nest. Similarly, the worldly spirit deceives us into making small concessions at first until it gradually overwhelms us. Evil progresses in small steps. If it were to come all of a sudden, we would not be deceived. You see, if you want to scald a frog, you must do it gradually pouring hot water on it at first. If you pour it all at once, it will jump, start running and escape. But if you start by pouring a little over it, the frog will at first move and shake it off, but then it will accept it. If you pour a little more, it will again shake it off until eventually it will be scalded without realizing it. If you could tell the frog, Hey, hey frog, get up and leave. I've poured hot water on you. It would still not leave. It would stay there and become more and more bloated until it's fully scalded. This is the manner in which the devil operates. He scalds us gradually. And in the end, we find ourselves scalded without even realizing it. priority must be given to the beauty of the soul. A soul moved by material beauty reveals that the vain world lives inside it, and that it is attracted by the creation and not by the creator, by clay and not by God. It makes no difference if the clay is pure and does not have the mud of sin in it. When the heart is attracted by earthly beauties, which, though not sinful, are still vain, it feels a worldly and a momentary joy, but this joy provides no divine consolation, no inner flutter with spiritual exaltation. By contrast, when man loves spiritual beauty, then the soul is filled and becomes beautiful. If human beings, especially those living in the, the monastic life, could see their inner ugliness, they would not pursue external beauty. When our souls have so many stains, so many smudges, are we going to be concerned, for instance, about our clothes? We wash our clothes, we even iron them, and we are clean outside, while inside, well, do not ask. If we were to realize how unclean we are inside, we would not be spending our time removing even the smallest stain from our clothes, since they are a thousand times cleaner than our souls. But if we don't see that, well then, we will go on removing even the tiniest stains trying to get our clothes all clean and proper. 
What is of paramount importance is to turn our attention to the spiritual cleanliness, to the internal rather than the external beauty. Priority must be given to the beauty of the soul and not to vain beauties because the Lord has told us a soul is worth more than the entire world. Matthew 16, 26. Worldly desires. Those who do not put the brakes on their heart's desires for unnecessary material things, not desires of the flesh. These are out of the question. But rather, and do not gather their mind inside their heart in order to offer everything they have together with their very soul to God will be very miserable. Yaranda, is it always bad to de desire something? No. The heart's desire is not bad in itself, but when things, even things that are not sinful, take up a piece of my heart, they diminish my love for Christ. Again, this kind of desire is bad because the enemy reduces my love for Christ. When I desire a useful thing, a book, for example, and it ends up taking up a piece of my heart, then that is bad. Why should a book take up a piece of my heart? Will I desire the book or will I yearn for Christ? Any desire, no matter how good it appears, cannot rival the desire for Christ or for the Panagia. When I give my heart to God, will not God give me his entire self in return? God seeks man's heart. My son, give me your heart. Proverbs twenty three twenty six. If man gives God his heart, God will grant him his heart's desires, as long as they will not be harmful to him. Only a heart given to Christ is not wasted. And only in Christ does one find in abundance the gift of divine love in this life and heavenly exaltation in the next life. We must avoid worldly things and not let them occupy our heart. We must use only the simplest means to accommodate our needs. We must make sure, however, that the few things we use are sound. If I use a beautiful thing, I give all my heart to that beauty and I leave nothing for God. You pass by somewhere and you see a house with a pretty marble work, designs, engravings. You admire the stones, the bricks, and you, you leave your heart there. Or you see a beautiful eyeglass frame in a store and you desire it. If you don't buy it, you leave your heart at the store. If you buy it, you're hanging your heart from the eyeglasses frames you're wearing. Uh, women are especially vulnerable to this kind of deception. Few of them do not waste their hearts on vanities. What I am trying to say is that the devil robs them of their rich heart through all these ephemeral, colorful, and shiny trinkets. Let's say one of them needs a plate. She will search for the one with a flowery pattern, as if the food would turn sour if the plate had no flowers. Some spiritual women may instead be moved by serious patterns, such as a double-headed eagle, and so on. And they wonder, why don't spiritual things touch me? Well, how can the heart be moved by spiritual things when it is scattered in cabinets and plates? You do not actually have a heart. You only have a piece of flesh which beats inside mechanically, tick-tack, 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 just like a clock, just to make you walk. It's because the heart is dispersed to so many things, a bit of it going here, a bit of it going there, a bit of it going over there, that nothing's left for Christ. In other words, Yana, that even these simple desires are sinful. These simple desires, even when they are not sinful, are actually worse than the sinful ones. A sinful desire will shake a man up at some point, and his conscience will bother him, and he will make an effort to repent. He will say, my God, I have sinned. On the contrary, these other desires, the good ones, do not concern him at all. He believes that he is doing well. I love well-made and beautiful things, he thinks. Besides, God created everything beautiful. Yes, but his love does not go to the creator. It goes to his creation, which is why we should break off from every desire. When someone makes an effort for Christ, by sacrificing what he loves, no matter how good what he loves is, God will grant him an even greater peace and rest. Before the heart is cleansed, it has worldly desires and finds joy in them. 
But when it is cleansed and purified, it, it no longer tolerates earthly desires, and its joys then are spiritual. The heart is purified when it loathes worldly desires. Until this happens, it is attracted to them. But you see, we do not want to upset the old self. We would rather do him all kinds of favors. How then can we become imitators of Christ? Yananda, when I have difficulty getting rid of a desire, must I persist in the struggle? Yes, even if your heart is displeased for not doing the things that put it to rest, you must still not obey it. If you do, you will feel a worldly joy and then again a worldly anxiety. Conversely, if you do not obey your heart and allow it to be gr gladly displeased because you avoid the things that comfort it, then divine grace comes to you. The goal is to attain divine grace. For this to happen, you must rid yourselves from desire, even good desire. You must break your will. Only then is man humbled, and once humility comes, divine grace follows. When the heart finds no joy in worldly things, it will find joy in spiritual things. We must avoid as much as possible worldly consolation and do the inner spiritual work necessary in order to acquire divine consolation. Worldly joys are material joys. Yet on the... Many times people say that they feel a void in their life even though they have everything. Real, genuine joy and delight can only be found in Christ. If you unite with him through prayer, your soul will find fulfillment. Secular people seek joy in self-indulgence, and some spiritual people look for it in theological discussions, speeches, and so on. And when it's over, they are left with a void wondering what to do next. Regardless of whether the things they work on are sinful or indifferent, the bottom line is the same. Why don't they at least go to sleep early and be fresh and rested at work in the morning? Satisfying the worldly desires of the heart does not bring us spiritual joy. It only brings anxiety. Worldly joy brings anxiety to spiritual people. Worldly joy is not a permanent true joy. It is a temporary joy a joy of the moment. It is material, not spiritual. But material delights cannot fill the human soul. In fact, they fill it with trash. When we experience spiritual joy, we will no longer desire the pleasures of material things. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with beholding thy glory. Psalm 17, verse 15. Worldly joy does not comfort the spiritual person. It only gives him fatigue if you place a spiritual person in a worldly home, he will not be comfortable. Even a secular person does not really find rest there. He only thinks he does. In fact, he only feels an external superficial enjoyment. In reality, in his heart, he is not pleased. He suffers. Yet on the, the order of things in the secular world gives one a feeling of suffocation. Well, people may be suffocating, but they are also asking for it, like the frog that runs straight into the snake's mouth. The snake is waiting near the pool, staring at the frog. If the frog is fooled and looks at the direction of the snake, it becomes electrified, dizzy, and he runs screaming into the snake's mouth. The snake then bites and poisons it to keep it from tossing left and right. The frog starts squealing, but it's too late. It is already poisoned. Even if you were to rescue it, it would still die. Yaranda, why do people take delight in worldly things? These days, people do not think of eternity. Their self-love makes them forget that all things will perish forever. They have not grasped the deeper meaning of life. They have not experienced other heavenly joys. Their heart does not leap for something higher. For example, you give someone a pumpkin, and he says, what a nice pumpkin. You give the same person a pineapple, and he says, the pineapple has scales, and throws it away because he has never tasted one before. Or try telling a mole, look how beautiful the sun is. It will still crawl into the ground. Those who are totally at peace 
in the material world resemble those silly little birds that do not stir inside the egg to break the shell and come out to enjoy the sun, the heavenly flight into the life of paradise, but remain still and die inside the eggshell. The Secular Spirit in the Spiritual Life Yaranda, sometimes you say that someone sees things through a European lens and not through the Eastern spirit. What do you mean by that? I mean that he sees with European eyes, with European logic. He sees things without faith and only through a merely human perspective. And what is the Eastern spirit? The day spring from the East has visited us from on high. And we who were in darkness and shadow have found the truth, for the Lord is born of the Virgin, from the hymns of the Nativity of our Lord. Which is to say, answer, when I say that someone has caught the Eastern spirit and abandoned the European, I mean that he does not rely on logic, on rationalism, and has accepted simplicity and piety, because this is the Orthodox spirit in which Christ rests. Simplicity and piety. Today, simplicity, the sacred simplicity which comforts the soul, is often missing from spiritual people. If someone does not renounce the secular spirit and does not live in a simple way, in other words, if he does not stop caring about how others see him or what they say about him, then he will not be akin to God or to the saints. In order to have a relationship with God and the saints, we must be active in the spiritual realm. The more we live with simplicity, especially in a synobium, the more we smooth out and remove the irregularities of our passions. Otherwise, we end up spending all our energy creating a fake person. For this reason, if we wish to become angels, we must first throw away the secular carnival. Do you know what secular people do, which spiritual people don't? Secular people take care to keep their yard clean without worrying if their house inside is full of trash. They sweep the yard and throw the trash inside the house. They think the others only see the yard. They do not see inside the house. In other words, I can have rubbish inside the house, but not on the outside. They are interested in being admired by everyone. By contrast, Spiritual people care to have the inside of their house clean. They are not interested in what people will say or think because Christ lives inside their house, in their heart, not in the yard. Sometimes, however, even spiritual people live in a superficial way, in a secular way, or to be more exact, in the manner of the Pharisees. These people do not think of how they will go to paradise, how they will get close to God, but of how they may appear good in this life. They are depriving themselves of all the spiritual joys when they could experience paradise in this life too. So they remain earthly people, striving to live a spiritual life in a secular manner. But they are empty inside. God is not present in them. Unfortunately, the secular spirit has influenced spiritual people a lot. If spiritual people act and think in a secular way, what should lay people do? When I asked some people to help drug-addicted youths, they told me, if we establish a home for drug addicts, no one, will domin no one will donate property to us. That is why we will build a retirement home instead. I am not saying that retirement homes are not needed. They are. But if we begin thinking this way, these institutions will not be charitable institutions, but sinkable institutions. What many don't understand is that worldly success is actually spiritual failure. The secular spirit in monasticism. Yananda, many people tell us, you are living in paradise. You should pray not to lose the real paradise. I would be comforted if secular people were impressed by your spiritual development while you remained unaware of it something that you would owe to your spiritual progress. In this case, spiritual progress would not be something that you pursued, but would instead happen by itself internally and naturally. 
Try not to lose yourselves in useless things and in the end lose Christ. As much as you can, try to acquire the monastic conscience. Live spiritually as nuns. Do not forget Christ, and Christ will remember you too. It is not my goal to upset you, but to help and support you. Try to discern the secular spirit which brings sorrow to Christ himself when it creeps into monastic life. Reject it like you would an alien spirit. Unfortunately, the secular spirit has entered many monasteries because nowadays some fathers promote the monastic life through a secular channel and do not lead souls to the patristic spirit of grace. I discern an anti-patristic spirit prevailing in the monasteries today. They do not accept what is truly good, the tradition of the fathers of the church. They do not live in a patristic manner. Instead, they level the spiritual heights in the name of obedience and the breaking of the will, and then go on to serve their own secular desires. But no progress can be made this way because they have made temptation and the secular spirit part of the synobitic life. We do not have the right to interpret the commandments of God according to our own interests. Neither do we have the right to present monasticism as we want it. It is another thing to stray because of human weakness and then to recognize that and humbly ask for God's mercy. But the worst thing for me is the fact that some people consider this secular spirit a sign of progress. On the contrary, they should consider it as a drawback and reject it at once in order to be cleansed spiritually and receive the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who sanctifies, informs, and supports our souls. There are some people who say we must project our civilization. What kind of civilization are we supposed to project? Our secular civilization? Normally, we as monks must present our spiritual civilization, our spiritual progress, where is this spiritual progress? We should not aim to surpass the secular people and secular achievements. This secular progress harms even those who live in the world, let alone the monk. We should run so fast spiritually that lay people will be forced to do something. If we just behave like a very spiritual lay person, we will not help them because they already have an example of lay people who are highly spiritual. We must surpass them. The monk should not have as his goal to show that he has made secular progress. This is to blaspheme against monasticism. The monk who thinks in a secular way has taken the wrong path. Whereas he set his mark on Christ, his soul is turning toward the world. Secular progress, when taken as progress, drives monasticism to spiritual disintegration. Nowadays, so many things are being lost in the world, but also in monasticism. Honor and respect are disappearing. And where they exist, people often refer to them as old-fashioned. This is why I feel so much pain, and at times I am ready to blow up. I feel like taking to the mountains. People who have not experienced something higher do not worry that much about living the spiritual life according to their own measures. But do you know what burden it is to live this way for those who have experienced something higher? If Christ made me worthy to live the monastic life that I really desired and to have died bravely in the process, I would have thought myself a casualty of the front lines of this war. But would it be worth, worth it to die, to make a confession of faith, a sacrifice, only so that the Holy Fathers will not be blasphemed? Why don't we give some thought about the Holy Fathers, whom we study continually, where and how they lived? The Lord said, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. What a tremendous thing! And you see how they were trying to imitate Christ in those caves? They experienced Christ's joy, because they emulated Christ in everything. Their full attention was focused on that one thing needful. The Holy Fathers had transformed the desert into a spiritual state, and we today are turning it into a secular state. While the Church of Christ is departing to the desert in order to be saved, we are converting the desert 
into a secular state, and we scandalize people who will not only remain helpless, but will also have nothing to hold on to. This is the great danger I see in these difficult years we're going through. And while it is even more important for us today to live a truly monastic way, so that we may be granted divine strength, unfortunately, the secular spirit has changed us and weakened us. In other words, as we banish our spirit, what is left behind is an empty corpse. Today, there are monks who live the monastic life on the outside. They do not smoke, they live a chaste life, they read the Philokalia, and they constantly talk about the fathers of the church. They are not different from lay people who are pleased with themselves because as children they did not tell any lies and always made the sign of the cross, went to church, and later as adults were careful with moral matters. Well, that's what's happening in some monasteries today, and many lay people find that attractive. But as they get acquainted with the monks or nuns, they realize that they maintain a secular spirit and are not really different from people who live in the world. At least if monks and nuns smoked, read newspapers, and spoke about politics, people would consider them secular and avoid them, which would have kept monasticism from being harmed. How can a monk move the heart of a layperson when he is spiritually drained? Alcohol will lose its pungency if we leave the bottle open. It can no longer kill germs, and neither will it ignite it if you light it. And if you put it in the spirit, in the spirit stove or lamp, it will also destroy the wick. Likewise, if the monk is not careful, he drives divine grace away in the end, is left only with his monastic habit. He too will be like the alcohol that has lost its spark. He won't be able to cauterize the devil. Angels are a light for monks, and monks are a light for men. St. John Climacus, Ladder of Divine Ascent, Step 26, verse 31. To continue, he will not even be a light to others. Do you realize how destructive this secular spirit is? If this true spirituality leaves monasticism, nothing's left. If salt has lost its taste, it is good for nothing. Garbage will at least turn into manure, but salt will not. If you put it in a plant, it will burn it. Today is a time when monasticism should shine. It is in these rotten times that we need the salt. The greatest contribution to society will be made by holy monasteries that do not have the secular mindset and have reached a spiritual state. They will not need to say much or do anything else because they will be able to speak through their way of life. This is what the world needs today. Do you see what has become of the Catholics? I remember years ago when I was at the Stomian Monastery in Konitsa, someone brought me an excerpt from a newspaper which said, quote, 300 nuns protested for not being allowed to watch a movie and for having their habits at full length and not up to the knee. I found it outrageous. I wondered to myself, then why did you become nuns? The article said that they eventually got rid of their habits altogether. Given the way that they were thinking, they had already thrown the habit away. Another time I saw a Catholic nun who did not differ at all from secular woman. She was supposedly performing missionary work, but looked no different than those very secular young women involved in various charities. We should not allow this European spirit to come into our lives. We should not reach this point. Yaranda, I find it so difficult to get rid of the secular way of thinking. Eh, it's not difficult. It requires vigilance, nipsis. You should constantly think of what Arsenios the Great used to say to himself. Arsenios, Arsenios, why have you left the world? We forget why we came to the Holy Monastery. In the beginning, everybody starts well, but not everybody ends up well because they forget why they went to the Holy Monastery. Yaranda, you said that the secular spirit enters monasticism and the truly spiritual way of life is lost. Will the true spirit of monasticism survive? 
answer, this is just a storm. It will pass. God will not allow for this to happen. Yaranda, I had this thought. Are there still monasteries that follow the spiritual path? Of course there are. Were it not so, the Panagia herself would come. She would escort us to jail. There are monks who lead a very spiritual and hesychistic life. There are such souls in every monastery, in every metropolis, and so forth. It is these rare, solitary souls who move God to tolerate the rest of us. The secular spirit is a disease. The most important thing today for someone is not to become accustomed to the secular spirit. This in itself is a sort of witness. We should try as much as we can not to be pulled away by this current, not to let this channel sweep us away. Smart fish don't get hooked. They see the bait, recognize it for what it is, and then get away. Dumb fish, on the other hand, see the bait, rush to eat it, and just like that, they're caught. This is how the world sets the bait, catches so many souls. People are attracted by the secular spirit, and consequently they end up hooked by it. The secular spirit is a disease, and must be avoided like a disease, no matter what one's station in life is. If we are to enjoy spiritual health and angelic delights, we must detach ourselves from the spirit of secular progress.